Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you to this panel uh, entitled Content is King, Branded Entertainment and the Future of Advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, this session is presented in partnership with Dubai Studio City. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome our panelists today. We have James Morton Howarth from Grama Film, Samir Shoeiri from Publicist Communications, Paul Trillo, Branded Content Filmmaker, Chris Capstick from Motivate Media Group, and we're delighted to have the moderator, Jose Papa, Managing Director of Can Lion. Please Please give them a very warm welcome. So uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, thank you, my esteemed group of panelists here. But the idea of us discussing content is king. Uh, around branded content and why and the evolution of branded content actually uh, I think it's important for us to explore the journey of first what it means, so uh, what it is, how we can partner effectively with brands, how we can measure results, what are the production needs that, are, that go behind successful uh, creative branded content initiatives. So it, it would be great from our group here to see your perspective because many people for the benefit of this audience what does branded content mean or how it intersects with branded entertainment or is it the same thing so it would be great to hear each one's perspective and then we jump start our debate here James all right um, I think so first and foremost, branded content is, is an opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity for brands to engage uh, and to entertain audiences around shared interests uh, in an authentic uh, and hopefully meaningful way. Um, but at its heart, it's entertaining content uh, across film, video, but also across other platforms, social platforms, and not just limited to you know, film and video content. It can be apps, experiences and events, um, which is the kind of things we're doing at Grammar Film. Paul. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, branded content is, uh, to me, it's always been like a funny term because it's, uh, it's so vague. Uh, and it's, it's literally everything. Um, it, could be, it could be a film, as like we're talking about. It could be an event, is like branded content. Uh, so, I don't know, I guess as it relates to me, I see it as, uh, an opportunity uh, to have like a patron. Um, so I, I approach the branded work I do as, um, you know, almost like personal work, but also keeping in mind how, uh, how is this like an extension of the brand ethos. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's the key. And I think that branded content that fails is something that doesn't quite understand like who they are as a company. Uh, like if there's any sort of identity crisis at the company, uh, you're gonna get kind of muddled branded content. So um, it's my responsibility to make something interesting but also kind of like uphold the, the identity and integrity of, of who's you know, sponsoring, who's my patron. Uh, hello everyone. So, um, for us, when we work, we're focused on advertising and we advertise brands and we create uh, pieces of content for brands. <coughs> and for us, branded content existed since ever, but it evolved. Um, any piece of content we create, we used to create content for magazines, they used to be pictures, now it's morphing into editorial. We used to create uh, TV copies that will go on TV. Now we're creating film that goes everywhere. So branded content for us is any piece of content that has an objective to drive. And whether it is branded or not branded, whether it's connected to another component that drives an overall experience for a brand, this is what it is. 
Today, we no longer talk about marketing strategies. We talk about content strategies. So when we deliver campaigns to clients, we're actually delivering content strategies that are interconnected with an ecosystem of distribution. So that's, that's uh, for me, how I see it. Yeah, thank you. Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I think what, what Paul said is, is true. And, and certainly for us, and this is slightly cliche to say it's about storytelling, but I think it's a way now for brands to create a much closer connection with their audiences outside of traditional ROI advertising or, or uh, brand retention advertising. It's, it's a way to tell their own unique story and kind of further establish their, their connection with their, their audience. And that, that, that's, that's what we're seeing at the moment. But uh, in a world where ROI is, is king, we say that content is king, but we know that ROI is king, uh, margins are under pressure, clients, they demand more and more effective and impactful results, sales results, and I'm just going to play devil's advocate here. So how can you sustain boldly prominent storytelling with, on the client side, the assurance that the ROI is there? Well, I, I, th I think that's one of the, 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 the big trade-offs, and it's something that I think all, all content creators are, uh, are grappling with. Um, the, 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 there's, there's two different uh, approaches, really. I mean, there, there's the need to sell product and drive ROI, and that's the first thing brands look at, and they, they want to see a return on investment for the money they spend. But then there's also a long-term game, which is investing in consistent and good quality content creation, be that a series of blog posts or... Uh, a video series and running that consistently and trusting in the people they're working with, trusting in the creators to, to produce good content that will resonate with an audience. It may not have an immediate uptick on the bottom line, it may not uh, <coughs> see an immediate increase in sales, but that consistent creation of content that's resonant for a particular audience will ultimately strengthen, strengthen that connection the brand has with its, with its customers over time. How brands get that signed off, how they communicate that to their finance departments and when they're setting budgets is, 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 is a different thing and that's something that we, we, you know, we need to get closer to, to kind of helping them solve at the moment. Yeah, I think, uh, I think what you touched on is, is the sort of the key to branded content is um, duration uh, and uh, how long, what is your commitment uh, and consistency uh, with the content you're creating. Um, I think the ultimate goal of branded content is a transformation of perception of the brand. And perception takes a very long time. Um, and so I think anyone looking for an immediate return on investment um, is probably gonna be slightly disappointed. Um, there's, you know, there's different cases where, you know, maybe, for instance, like if you're advertising a camera and you're doing a short film that's using the camera, there's like a direct product that relates to what you're creating, but that's like a uh, more of an exception to the rule that most, most of the time this is the brand investing in a long-term transformation of uh, how the public views them. Um, so that's, that's where I think the, uh, the return is. I think one of the dangers is that um, there can be a sort of me too attitude. Um, we get brands that see successful work that we've done for other clients and they say, well, we want to do that. We want to do that, but with our logo on it. And you're like, it's not going to really work uh, that way and, and we can't help you. But you know, if we want to build a strategy and have a clear plan of you know, what is your brand philosophy, how can we communicate that in a way that is entertaining? And that is the key. You've got to entertain audiences today. People know what they want, they know what they like, and they're going to turn you off if it's not interesting to them. So it's all about having good ideas, good strategy, and building something together over a period of time, and that's a process. Not many brands, you know, understand it in that way, and it's kind of our duty to sort of help steer them through it and build something. I understand, um, actually, yeah. that you, you uh, sorry. It's okay. I just wanted to say something about the ROI specifically. Um, today, marketing managers and brands, they're very meticulous on spending money. 
and they want to see where this money is going. And they want to understand if this activity is building equity for their brand, whether in the marketplace or in people's mind. And the main challenge that we see when we build branded content is that when you build something that is uh, unique and very insightful and very emotional, what is the metric that you put under to drive, to see if it's driving sales? If it builds a positive emotion and perception with, this, with your audience, and you change the perception of this brand, the impact could be long-term. And it's, it's, it's this which is the untangible ROI that they can't see immediately on the shelf if the product moves. So the needle, did it move, yes or no, on sales? And, and I think the brands that succeeded the most in leveraging the ROI are the brands that went into a long-term activity because you cannot measure it with one go. And we see this, we see this with our client. They tell us, you did a, an amazing viral film. We have one, 10 million views on it, but we don't see the, what's the benefit. We don't see the product moving on shelf. So this is, the, the, this is the tension today that we have. When we go into this journey, it's not one activity, it's not two. It's an ongoing activity that, is, that has a little bit of both. So, so this is a brilliant segue here for uh, maybe showing what is one of the best global benchmarks in branded content. It's uh, James's video. You brought it, no? From yeah. So we, uh, you know, we're very fortunate. We've um, developed a relationship with Red Bull over a number of years. Um, actually, the first clip we made for them uh, was for a long time their most successful piece of branded content in terms of return on investment. A clip with Danny McCaskill um, riding his bike across Scotland. Um, and that's led us on an exciting journey with them as they've grown and developed. One of the interesting things, we'll play the clip in a moment, um, is that now other brands are coming to Red Bull and hoping to learn uh, and also partner. And that's an interesting sort of trend that we're seeing, not just with Red Bull, but with other people as brands coming together to co-create. Uh, and when that happens in a, in a beneficial way to both, I think it can be quite exciting. So this is, um, this is an early trailer for, uh, it's a half hour documentary um, for Red Bull uh, and Jeep. And it's um, the story of a big wave surfer called Andrew Cotton from the UK, as he um, thinks he's found the biggest wave in the world to surf. Uh, and it's three miles uh, off the coast of Ireland in the Atlantic. And, um, well, we'll see what, get a clue of what happens. The first time I actually saw the wave, we had two jet skis, we were driven like 45 minutes. Had to see it's freezing cold, it's January. It was giant, giant, perfect. So much water moving. I knew that I was gonna have to come back. Dealing with a giant wave in the middle of nowhere in freezing cold island brings a whole nother level of danger. The Atlantic actually has always been known as the place for the perfect storm, and there's so many uncharted territories. Whatever happens, it's big. He's obsessed, he'll do it until he. I have to be fully committed, and I can't be any more than 24 hours away from this wave. There's a warning of a heavy Atlantic swell. The potential is just insane, and I know it can produce some of the biggest waves ever. Um, so, you know, the, the, the partnership there is very authentic. You know, these guys have got a journey to make and, you know, they need a car and they're in a Jeep and it's very subtle. You would see those shots no matter what the car. Um, so, you know, I think that worked very well for both parties. It's a long form piece, at half an hour long, that you can find on, on Red Bull's channels. Um, but then we build out a kit of parts 
that aren't just cut downs of the film. You know, they're pieces of content in their own right that work for Jeep, that work for Rebel, um, and that build anticipation around the project. And, and what kind of partnership you need to build with the CMO to see organizations embracing initiatives like this one, where you have a 30-minute piece that you do not show in one single minute a piece of their, their own merchandising. So uh, it's not about the drink, it's not about the nature of the drink, it's about lifestyle, it's about adventure, it's about stretch over limits, it's stretching your limits, etc. But how bold a brand needs to be to build something like that. So what is the kind of a profile of the new CMO that embraces initiatives like this one? Yeah, uh, I mean, if, if you look at the piece that we just saw, it's beautiful, by the way, uh, congrats. Um, the, the model of Red Bull today is they make more money out of their content than out of their drinks. So it's true there's a mindset, definitely, into it, but also the opportunity of identifying what this small change in how you used to do stuff can affect your business and your business model. And Red Bull today started with an experiment to be true to themselves on what they believe their brand is and their communication and their audience are and what they like to watch and what they like to see. And they built on this huge capital that transformed their business. Sometimes it's not in, it should not stay in the CMO realm. It's a decision that goes in the CEO if they see it. But in less traditional firms that um, have a hierarchy that is more structured and maybe less agile than, than organizations, uh, uh, we're not all as lucky as... Uh, as you to work on Red Bull, um, but you, we, f we feel that there's a bigger tension between the CMO and the CEOs. The CMO who wants to drive better creativity, build their brands, and in today's re global economic situation, we see they are being um, um, hold, hold off by the CEOs who want to drive sales results. Uh, and that's, that's the reality. Uh, it's not that the CMO is, they're not trying, they are. They understand how digital and branded content is changing the industry. But sometimes the reality, the economic reality, is not allowing them to do what they want. And actually, this is one eventually for you, Chris, because this is a brand that is a global brand that has been investing massive resources into building these amazing, beautiful stories. But when we talk about regional markets, you see that you have regional budgets, regional limitations. How can you be creative working with less resources? And I don't know if you have good, good examples for the MENA region here on cool branded content solutions and initiatives that are working on a regional basis. Yeah, okay. I mean, the, I mean, I mean it's, it's certainly different. I mean, de definitely the, the, those type of budgets to produce a film like that are really only uh, reserved for very big TVC, uh, big brand launch campaigns that are going on pan-regional uh, television here. The, we, we, we find a lot of brands here are dipping their toe into the water of branded content, particularly branded video. Um, they don't necessarily want to spend a lot of money, but they kind of expect by some sort of social media alchemy that, that the videos will go viral. And, and that's not to say it's not impossible to make a great video on, on a limited budget, but there, there, there is a, a, a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Um, but you, I think you really need, uh, you, you need to be working with clients that have got the, the kind of patience and the time to, uh, to invest in that or have a kind of unique proposition that, that, that allows them to do that. I mean, if, if I can show a video in, in, in a short while, um, we've produced a series of films for uh, a hotel brand called Rove Hotels. They're part of EMAR, and 
their, their kind of very unique proposition is they want to reach a millennial audience, they want to reach kind of backpackers that are passing through Dubai that uh, may be kind of put off by uh, staying in a five-star hotel. And one thing we've obviously got loads of here in Dubai is, is five-star hotels, they're, they're everywhere, so their kind of um, plan is to kind of differentiate that. So we, we shot a series of videos, about 15 videos, with graffiti artists, with poets, with musicians, and they're all shot on pretty basic equipment, either shot on Osmos or iPhones, uh, a few Canon DSLRs, um, that were kind of shot on, on, a, on a low budget. And it actually became quite authentic, and, it, and it's worked well for them because the audience they want to reach aren't necessarily looking to be kind of overwhelmed with a big budget production. Um, and so there was kind of like a level of authenticity there that, that allowed us to do that. We were able to produce it within the, the, the client's budget as well. So I, I would say, yeah, I mean, that, that is one of the things we see. I think where campaigns work well in this region is if, if you, you have a, a willing client that's prepared to kind of experiment or, or in, in the case that we have, not a particularly great budget, so are happy for you to take liberties or, or to kind of take chances and use lesser kit to create something that's still kind of cool and resonates, or at least that's what we hope. Do we have the video? Great. Hello, my name is Iyad, and this is my teammate, MD. Yo. Today we're here, we're gonna be exploring downtown Dubai through parkour. Let's go. Let's go. Parkour, by definition, is getting from point A to point B in the fastest way possible. What we like to do is add our own style to it, our own twist, through adding some flips or different ways of doing it. Doesn't have to be as fast as possible. Downtown Dubai is, is a great place for doing parkour. There's so many different walls, stairs, railings. I'd recommend it to all my parkour friends. It's really easy to get to from the Robo Hotels. If you're staying there, definitely train outside. Parkour originated in France. Like there's many contradictions on how it started, but it started in France. People think it's like crazy jumps and crazy flips. You don't see the baby steps to it. If you see the small progressions into it, you'd think it's very possible to everyone. What goes through my mind when I do parkour is quite hard to describe because people would look at the rail very differently. Even if I'm not training, even if I'm just like walking in the place, I'd see so many different jumps, so many different possibilities. And yeah, it just changes your way of thinking. You look at stuff from a different perspective. After a long day of training and jumping all over downtown Dubai, we're gonna head back to the Robo Hotel to grab some food at the daily. Thanks for watching the video, peace. Very cool. Very cool because you, you see the difference. You see a, a big, massive budget with huge storylines. But then I'm going to be continuing to be a bit of a, a controversial here. So measuring impact, you see. In the end, what matters is the reach of the message. And in the end, conversion of such reach. Uh, what you're saying is that you can be as effective doing simple but effective storytelling uh, when compared to lavish and big productions like the Red Bull one? It wasn't that big. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I, th I think for us, I mean, that was one of the, the first videos we produced for them. We've done a series now. And, and actually, as, as it's gone on, I mean, there were whole shots we had to refilm where their logo was on the side of the wall as the guy was doing the flip, and then we had this device at the end where they had to somersault into the hotel. And actually, a year down the line, all of those kind of elements have been taken away now. They've kind of got the confidence to not necessarily see the brand so kind of prominently placed, which, which is good. Again, I think that just kind of emphasizes their, their trust in the process and their trust in the ability of their customers to get it without kind of being smashed over the head with it all the time. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an evolving process, but we're, we're, we're happy with how it's going. Does it make sense to see then that this kind of a campaign could be more for the medium to short term initiatives where you have to see impacts that occur in a shorter time frame and then these, the big 
projects that involve bigger P&Ls, these are the ones, to your point in the beginning, Chris, that you are investing into the, into the long term, building the brand into the long term, co correct? Yes, yeah, very much so. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Paul, do you have... Is there a question you, or uh, no, if you, just, if just you, start what, talking? What, what, yeah, what is your <laughs> vision here from even a creative standpoint, you see? So how can you, in today's world where you can, with an iPhone, be pretty creative, you see? Uh, how can you balance creativity, meaning editorial line creation and uh, the whole production piece? How can you balance with these big, enormous projects like the sure. Lego movie, for example, yeah. you see? Yeah, I mean, um, the, I think a lot of my work is, um, at least, you know, the shorter form work is technique based or effect based or there's some sort of illusion or trick that's going on. And, um, you know, I, I try to think conceptually about, you know, I try to create a rule and then like stick to the rule um, when creating something, whether it's short films or music videos. And um, I, th I think I was able to leverage that in creating a few branded pieces. Um, two of the ones that I have uh, that I'm gonna show are like camera related. Um, and it's, I think the sort of idea is, um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a, an iPhone or a cell phone um, or if it's a small DSLR camera or whatever it is, it's about like um, just thinking outside the box and how you use the camera and how you can use a smaller camera and like what, is, what does that open up um, creatively, you know, if, if, you know, instead of having a lens this big, like use it to your advantage that the lens is only that big. Um, so I guess, yeah, I guess that, that's where um, the product actually does tie into the piece and it's, it's, um, it's not just about some sort of like vague brand um, perception that it's actually relating the, the brand and the product to trying to create something interesting. So it's kind of doing like two things um, where it shows that, oh, the brand is like thinking creatively um, but they're also like, Show, it's also kind of a commercial for the product itself. Um, so the first piece that I'm gonna show is uh, something I did for Microsoft and um, one of their cell phones. Um, in this case, it's 50 of their cell phones. Um, that is the first um, mobile bullet time rig that like run, runs off of a Wi-Fi network, not grounded, like tethered to anything. and running off of a gas generator and all that stuff was kind of pushed around Manhattan. Um, and it was something I, I didn't know if it was possible to even pull off when, when I pitched the idea. The, uh, Nokia and Microsoft just came to me and they're like, what can you do with 50 phones? And I was like, uh, I, I don't know, sell them on eBay? <laughs> um, so, but I, I thought like, okay, well it'd be interesting to do a, um, a mobile bullet time rig, not just a, a, a studio thing, and, and try to get street photography, because um, that's that's how phones are used. They're they're used out on the streets normally. So um, I guess like tying the use case, but like doing take elevating it with this technique, um, and they're also advertising this uh, sort of 41 megapixel camera inside of a phone. So um, trying to take advantage of the quality of you know such a small camera. The second clip is um, also for uh, a cell phone company, I guess, but, uh, but the product isn't related, it's for Samsung, and it was, just a, um, it was just a short film series that Vimeo had kind of helped facilitate where they got Vimeo staff pick filmmakers and they paired it with the brand and um, had a very wide open brief about how technology connects people and um, there's some amazing films in the series, it's called the Connected series, um, and people, it was, it was cool to like see all the different directions different filmmakers took with this like, literally the brief was just how does technology connect people, and it, that were, there's nothing else with it, which is like kind of daunting, but it's also exciting, and um, it allowed people to just approach, um, approach it as if they were creating their own work, um, and I think, I guess the, the lesson there was um, Vimeo prepping Samsung to just let the creators do their job and kind of not get in the way. 
Um, I think that that's, that's a key aspect in creating good branded content is uh, a, a level of trust that's like built on it. Like the, it's like a foundation of trust because um, if there's any sort of cracks in the foundation, you're going to see see it ripple effects later of like you know brands feeling insecure about the final product and all this stuff. So it's really it it, it, it takes time for the agency in this case Vimeo, which was sort of acting as an agency. Um, to like really establish the trust with the brand um, to create work that people actually want to watch. Um, and then the third piece is, is similar. It was, a, it, was a, it was actually a short film that I had, um, I was gonna go off and make on my own and it happened to align with this brief that came from Olympus um, just to use their ca camera in an interesting way. And it, it, it worked out great because it was a lightweight camera and the camera's attached to someone's body the entire time. Um, so that was an amazing just kind of alignment of stars where I was, I was about to spend my own money uh, to make this film and literally like the next month uh, Olympus came around uh, with this brief and I got to make, you know, a short film that I think, I, I don't know if I would have done anything differently had there been no brand, um, so I, you know, it was uh, it was a unique opportunity. But I thought it was cool that Olymp Olympus like didn't give any notes and just kind of like let the people do their thing. So Could, can I yeah. just ask on that? Yeah. So what what relationship did you have with them beforehand for them to have so much trust in you to do that? Because that's really interesting. It's a really bold film, and sure, it's, it's impressive that they, they yeah. Signed I off mean, on that. Uh, personally, I, I had. Um, no relationship with them, um, which makes it all the more bizarre. Uh, they, that was again, that was facilitated through Vimeo. So I think Vimeo was leveraging their, their brand of, hey, we have um, interesting filmmakers on our platform. We have a, a, a collection of staff picked films and uh, filmmakers behind those films. That's like, that, that is like Vimeo's like resource. That's what they have to offer. And um, they've kind of separated themselves from YouTube uh, because of that. So, Olymp so when they do these brand partnerships, um, there's this understanding that, um, hey, look, like people don't always have uh, you know inside the box ideas on Vimeo. They're not, um, or they're not vloggers. They're, they're each Vimeo creator does what they do, um, and just let them do what they do, and uh, and. You know, fortunately, the, the brands listen to that. They, I, I guess, they know why they're coming to Vimeo, um, and uh, yeah. So that it's that's the, that's where the trust comes in. But I, I had no no talks with uh, with the brands directly, and and in turn, they also like didn't really provide feedback on the <laughs> stuff, which was bizarre. I do a lot of commercials too, so I'm I'm used to feedback. I'm used to things being destroyed. Uh, so it's it's it was yeah. It's a it's an unsettling feeling when. You Get no notes, um, and then the the second or the Microsoft thing that was actually with um, with like Microsoft Brand Labs. I knew um, someone at the Brand Labs there, and um, that was a direct relationship. And it was his job to sell it up the chain, um, but we had a really good relationship um, that kind of just built over time, and um, actually started out as. Um, Nokia was doing their own branded thing on just like profiling artists, right? And this was like part of their brand perception. They somehow found me and they're like, oh, you do kind of weird video stuff. Like maybe you can do weird stuff with our phones. And then it, that, you know, four projects later, like, uh, you know, we kind of built this relationship. So, yeah. Do we have examples? Uh, I hope so. Yeah.
disappear for just a moment. There's this theory that if you can focus, if you can concentrate your brain activity with enough discipline, you can transcend time. You could re-experience a memory, a place in time as, as if it were new. The same sounds, smells, sights, the same, the same feeling. Yeah, sorry, I, I, the second one, I, um, I don't know if I provided enough context, but it was like, so the brief was um, create a film about how technology connects people, and I um, came up with this story about uh, sort of like online stalking um, and uh, how we form odd relationships now that have never existed before and how this guy sort of finds his doppelganger uh, through some sort of facial recognition app and then goes and stalks him and tries to, it, it's trying to be one of those sort of like, almost like Prince and the Popper type of like trading lives thing, but it like fails hor horribly because it's like done a little bit more realistically if someone actually stalked you and tracked you down and wanted to change uh, jobs with you. Um, in real life, I don't think that would work out very well. So that's, so it was me sort of poking fun at that genre. Um, so yeah. So one of the things that I see is the biggest challenge you have such compelling tools to produce awesome content today. And you have the brands beginning to engage in these journeys. But people have their time spam so short and, and there are so many multiple different platforms out there. Attention spam is so difficult. So how, how can we balance getting the message across in a purposeful but effective way given we have so many different elements of attracting people's attention, you see? So yeah. how can you differentiate yourself from the crowd? Oh yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the hardest thing, whether you're making something a personal piece or uh, a piece for someone else. And I think it is, it is sort of an uphill battle because people, you know, it's like, oh, you have to watch this film made by this giant corporation. Like, you know, like what, it's like hard to write like the uh, clickbait title for that. Um, there, there's an immediate like turn off, I think, when people are like, I really want to spend like 13 minutes watching like a commercial. Um, so you, I mean, it just, it has to be different. Um, it really just, you have to be offering some, you can't just be like um, kind of what you were hinting at. You can't just be like, oh, we want to do what they did, uh, but, but with our logo at the end. You have to be, uh, the brand has to be willing to just try something new and tell like a, tell a story that has just integrity on its own, regardless of the brand. Um, and and Sam Samer, if, if you saw like you have an amazing project in your hands, but you are challenged to get the message in a powerful way across, and uh, so what, what, how you would, define the strategy to kind of uh, which platforms you would use, how you would trigger this message to viralize, you see, and make it really purposeful on both the audience reach, but ultimately becoming a commercial success. Yeah, so um, that's what we, we call in today's age um, a, a campaign, a social media campaign, where ultimately, we start with a piece, a branded content piece, but around this piece we create an interconnected ecosystem of content and people that can participate. So you end up building an experience. You don't end up stopping at one piece of content. So in the experience, and we have, a, we have a case film, it's not a piece of content only, that will showcase how we did that for Johnny Walker in, in Lebanon. And we actually um, started from an insight where the country used, was passing through a very, very difficult period of time. And the brand, because it stands for optimism and their motto is keep walking, we felt that it's very relevant for the brand to come in and play a role in people's lives to communicate hope and address it in a very positive manner. So we released one piece of content online, unbranded, 
and we co-created. So one way we feel that branded content can happen, the same way you can create a film with a content uh, 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 maker, you can co-create with bloggers, with influencers, and with people. So we went down to the streets, we created with people, we engaged with them, and I think the case will, will show you how from one piece of content, we ended up creating more than 200 unique pieces of content with starting from our piece and then with people and bloggers and influencers uh, all over. So, Do we have it? Yeah. Great. In 2014, a dark cloud was hanging over Lebanon yet again. The media competed to paint a grim image of the future, and people followed, paralyzing the country. The Lebanese were forgetting what they are truly capable of. We needed to remind them and empower them to revive faith in themselves. We communicated a message. A resilient flame battles a menacing storm. We released the film during the grim 8 o'clock news and on social media. The flame in the Lebanese was awakened, and when they reacted, we were ready. A calligrapher brought their messages of resilience to life with fire, and we replied to each person individually with carefully crafted images signed with their names. The conversation kept growing as we displayed new images every day on the streets and in dailies. For 20 nights, we traveled all around the country, writing hundreds of people's messages, making appearances at cultural and nightlife events, and inviting influencers and bloggers to join us. Public engagement was growing with every image shared on social media, and hope was renewed, creating the shift in conversation the Lebanese needed. This ultimately influenced the mass media, leading journalists to focus on Lebanon's achievements instead of its failures. And the most watched TV talk show that had declared Lebanon the Republic of Failure started 2015 with an episode titled The Republic of Hope. From the Republic of Failure to the Republic of Hope. These people who saw this today, for example, there are a lot of people who are in this country and who are in this country. By 2015, it was clear that whatever storm may come in the future, the flame in the Lebanese burns on. Amazing. I'm going to ask you to drive the same campaign in Brazil, my home country. <laughs> I have to say, like, I think that's what's really exciting about branded content, is it's a real-time thing that you can grow and adapt and tell the story as you're going. It's not a commercial, a spot that's done months in advance and just goes out in one place. And that you can be on all these platforms, change things as they happen, and create that level of change is uh, really Con nice. Conversation, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's about the, the sustainability of, of um, good branded content is uh, creating the conversation. So, the, yeah, the, the one thing I would say on that, though, is I think the, the important thing, which, and that's a great example of, is to actually invest in the distribution of, of, of the finished product. So, like, the, it's, it's fine doing great work, but if it's just sitting on a brand's owned channels, then there's no guarantee it's going to reach the right audience, and I think that often happens. So brands commit to, to, to doing the work, and they create it, and then it just sits on their Facebook page, or it sits on their website, and actually, the, the, to guarantee a resonance and guarantee an audience reach, adding an element of distribution, paying to reach your audience in the right places, and that seemed like there was... You know, through the investment that was made, you got a good earned media back from it as well. Uh, but just relying on it being on own media is probably not going the, the, the full way. And, and there needs to be a bigger commitment to invest in distribution, push your message out there, just like you would if it was a call to action ad for a discount sale you've got at the weekend. It's the same level of spend that brands need to commit to. I am 100%. I think uh, having uh, the right ecosystem to drive engagement is key. I think what's most important is the authenticity. And I think we spoke a little bit about authenticity. I think Paul touched a little bit upon it. And this, this campaign specifically is, looks like a campaign by the people because it's authentic. It doesn't drive any consumption whatsoever. 
It's only on the promise of what the brand holds, so it's an equity campaign that was adopted by people and they felt that it, they, if they create a piece of content with it, if they co-create with this brand, they're representing themselves, they're not representing the brand. And this is what, what we feel um, the ecosystem of this connected platforms enabled us to do. Uh, I think we have some time for a Q&A, which we should definitely take advantage of this great panel here. Hi, good afternoon. I have a question for Mr. Summer. How is it possible for a brand to not just communicate uh, digitally, but turn it into a conversation for a brand which is not really recognized everywhere. Now, for example, for Johnny Walker, okay, everyone are aware about it, but what if it's a brand which no one has any idea about? How do you turn it from communication to a conversation? I think if you define what your brand stands for and what the values of the, your brand are, forget if it's known or not known then you, start, you build communication that drives its equity, and you build its equity. Johnny Walker was not built in one day, it took time, true, it's a mega brand, but you have other brands in the region, small brands, that mushroomed very, very fast because they were very true to what they want to be and what they want to represent. And after we defined this strategic guideline of who you are and what you want to be, then your communication can fall easier because then you create true to your equity. Hi, Nick Walsh from Media971 based here in uh, Dubai. There's a lot of conversation at the moment about how big brands in particular who will have the resources are going to become their own publisher. So people like us and you who've made films or written copy or done whatever we've done in the past will kind of go in-house in an in-house newsroom. What's your view on that? Uh, if I I, I, th I think it's, it, it's good and it should be in encouraged. Um, there, there is, the, the only thing without, the, the, the danger I guess is not having an outside filter or an independent company. So for us, I mean, we were a magazine company up to five years ago and we've, we've diversified since then. But a good director, a good journalist that ha has an eye for what resonates with the end user. and. and what we've seen with some brands that have created their own kind of storytelling labs or their own content studios internally is everything becomes this kind of push content. As much as they, they don't want it to, they, they, they inevitably, by being in-house, end up sell, 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 and, and there's less kind of thought for the, for the, the, the end consumer. So, yes, it, it can work, but, but brands really need to, even if they employ a, a brand publishing arm or, or an internal content studio, they need to do so with, with a view that that will be an autonomous business that will make its own decisions and kind of operate independently from the kind of core P&L or the core ROI requirements of, 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 of the, the brand. That's my view. I'd just like to highlight one thing. I think it's what's super exciting about what's happening today in this medium is that you see your traditional model of agencies and production houses that used to produce these pieces, they're questioning that. I'm not sure if this has been solved, it's not. There's the co-creation model that works. We work with Vimeo, we work with YouTube, we work with uh, end directors, filmmakers, we, we, we're trying to work. Sometimes we're even pitching agile structures where our content arm is not defined. So we define who to work with by project. This is evolving and I think it's a witness of how times are changing. Uh, from, an, from an advertising standpoint, as an advertising agency, um, I tell you that we recognize that we need to go beyond our creative pool of talent to sustain delivery of what people expect from us today and we recognize that times are changing and we need to change our creative model. Any more questions? Any final comments?
I mean, this is a big one, but what would you define as the ultimate metric of branded content marketing success? Like, what is the ultimate metric? If it's long term, if we're looking at it and we're not, we're keeping ROI, you know, autonomous. So, how do you know that you're really making an impact? Market share, NPS, all these things sound really nice in case studies, but how do you make that argument with something tangible so that it happens within? An organization, and there, there's faith and belief that you know it's worth it. Oh, sure. I have an interesting one also, so please, because I'm moderating only. But this one, I yeah. So just to repeat the question, so it's it's how do you, how do you measure um, the? Is it going back to like the ROI question, or um, yeah. I mean, I think. Uh, I think like a good metric is uh, just even talking about your Johnny Walker thing um, is is really engagement and it's not necessarily money. Um, sure, you could track money across a five year span and see uh, like when you started doing interesting branded content uh, and if if there was any sort of increase. But I, I think it's um, it's engagement and um, however relevant you stay um, in articles and stuff like that, that um, if, you're, if, if, if there's like an ongoing story uh, that keeps evolving um, and you know, your name is still like on the tips of people's tongues, I think that's, the, that's really the, the best way to, to measure it um, because it's, doesn't have a direct like uh, doesn't always have a direct like commercial purpose, um, so you shouldn't really be measuring it um, from a money standpoint because that's not really why uh, you should be getting into it in the first place. So you have to measure it with something else besides money. So um, yeah, and and I would also say I mean something's just kind of uh, very difficult to, to measure anyway. I mean um, if you think of a lot of James's films for uh, Red Bull, people that I mean. People look forward to that. If you see a new Red Bull uh, video on your Instagram feed, you kind of almost immediately know it's going to be cool and it's going to be interesting. So I think the work's already been done there. I mean, that's been established as there's an expectation that the, 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 con the, the content is going to be good. So c being able to create that and position that uh, is good if you've got that excitement and audiences are looking forward to it, just like you'll be looking forward to know, like the new Star Wars movie coming out or something like that, to be looking forward to the next bit of branded content and to be sharing that and, and having that level of engagement is... It's kind of the holy grail, really. It's where you, you want to be. And that's kind of separate from anything to do with the profit and loss or the, the, the ROI. It's just what good storytelling should, should, should be about. With, uh, this is, I swear to God, this is not a sales pitch on can lines, okay? <laughs> really. But uh, uh, Thea, who manages Dubai Links, uh, she was kind enough to uh, book. We have eight presentations these next three days for brands, for agencies, etc., on why creativity matters. And we've been doing these presentations to showcase that there is a clear correlation on those bold storytellers, brand storytellers, that decided to go into journeys of really embracing creativity, okay? And by really embracing creativity means, and we we're tracing this correlation with our Creative Marketer of the Year awarded in Cannes, okay? So we have examples like Burger King, like Heineken, etc. And we are uh, cross-secting their journey into embracing creativity with shareholder value. And then it's pretty simple because when we compare the growth on their shares vis-a-vis S&P 500, and when we define this with uh, when they decided to be bolder on creative storytelling, you have the ROI there. And, uh, and we're working also with McKinsey. McKinsey. So uh, they created a, what, are, what, what they're calling a creative innovation index, which analyzes those organizations that for the last 16 years have been driving creativity and how it is associated to value creation. So, it is a proven case that, yes, yourself being more creative ultimately uh, drives value. Yeah. I think we conclude.
So uh, thank you so much, esteemed panelists. It's been a pleasure to meet you all. And thank you for uh, a great audience here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.